I'm confident I've got the best bank CEO job in the world and maybe one of the best CEO jobs. That's Greg Becker, the now former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank in 2021. Two years later, federal regulators seized control of the lender as it stood on the brink of collapse. This is a classic bank run. And when the bank run starts, you don't want to be the last guy and wondering what happened. So how did we get from this to this? Silicon Valley Bank was the U.S.'s 16th largest bank. With about $212 billion in assets, it was a fraction the size of J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest lender. But it had an outsized influence in tech, which is 10% of the U.S. economy. Let's go back to how it all started. SVB was founded back in 1983 by three businessmen. The founding myth is that the idea came up during a poker game, but that's only half of the story. Bob Medeiros, one of the co-founders, was teaching a class at Stanford, and one question kept coming up. A lot of them came and wondered how they could get financing from banks because they just weren't, they, if you had an idea, the venture capitalists weren't around yet. I got the idea that, hey, maybe, just maybe, after the Reagan came in and eased up the regulatory structure, that uh, there could be a financial institution. So from the very outset, Silicon Valley Bank intended to work with companies who might otherwise struggle with established lenders like a Wells Fargo or Bank of America. The other thing that most bankers don't understand that I think uh, people here in the Valley understand, you know, somebody's got a product, then the product's outdated, the company goes out of business. They don't realize the R&D that goes into the next product and, uh, and the intellectual properties. That was huge for the tech industry. Back then, Silicon Valley was mostly about hardware. Think makers of silicon chips and early PCs like Intel and Hewlett Packard. But SVB was part of a new wave of investing. Rather than focusing on how profitable a firm is, tech investors instead often prioritize how fast it's growing. They assume, sometimes naively, that at a certain point, the company will stop reinvesting its earnings in things like acquiring new customers and instead become profitable. Flash forward a few decades, and SVB is riding the coattails of a booming venture capital industry that it helped to facilitate. Venture investments approached $330 billion in 2021, nearly doubling from a year earlier. At this point, SVB liked to say that it was doing business with about half of all venture-backed tech and healthcare startups in the U.S. I don't think there could be anyone who's touched the venture capital industry in the last 40 years who doesn't have some exposure to junior-type banks like SVB and Signature and a whole host of others. It's become part of the fabric of the, of the venture community. The bank went from $17 billion in deposits in 2011 to $189 billion a decade later. It grew faster than any bank in the S&P 500, and it wasn't even a member of the index. Now, banks make money by taking in deposits and lending them out at higher rates, as well as investing them. And typically, government bonds like treasuries rank among the safest investments out there. So the bank plowed tens of billions of dollars into them. Long-term government debt didn't generate much interest or yield. And as long as interest rates stayed low, pretty key detail here, they wouldn't lose their value. The company was aware of the risk. In late 2020, the bank's Asset Liability Committee received an internal recommendation that it should invest new deposits in lower yielding short-term bonds, just in case interest rates increased. But that would have cost millions and executives frowned on the idea. Instead, they continued to invest in the higher yield bonds. During the Obama-Biden administration, we put in place tough requirements on banks like Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, including the Dodd-Frank law to make sure that the crisis we saw in 2008 would not happen again. Unfortunately, the last administration rolled back some of these requirements. As the VC industry grew more influential, Becker and a slew of leaders at other regional banks pushed for deregulation. They got what they wanted. The strict capital rules introduced after the great financial crisis would only be reserved for the mega banks. This teed up Silicon Valley Bank to invest in securities without a lot of government oversight, which was okay until inflation started picking up. We finally got the first Fed rate hike of this cycle. Seven hikes for this year. Do you really think that a tightening cycle is not going to have any effect on the real economy? The Fed embarked upon its most aggressive interest rate hike campaign ever, raising its benchmark rate seven times last year. That changed everything. 
and it created two big problems for SVB. First, it became a lot harder for startups to raise new money. So those that weren't already profitable, the same companies for which the bank had been founded, became more likely to draw down their existing funds, prompting SVB's deposits to drop by $16 billion in 2022. That was the most on record. Second, the value of SVB's bond investments declined, also by $16 billion. Because investors could now buy bonds with higher yields, those with a low yield were less valuable. That doesn't matter much if clients keep their money in the bank, but a lot of them were pulling it out. These two problems combined meant losses that were purely theoretical were becoming all too real. In a worst case scenario, SVB wouldn't have enough money to cover everyone's deposits. On March 8th, it made an announcement that shocked the market. It sold $21 billion of its assets, including a lot of that government debt, essentially to make sure it could fund all those withdrawals and it did so at a loss of $1.8 billion. To plug the gap, it was looking to raise more capital by selling billions of dollars of shares. That sparked a panic. No stock has been hurt more than SVB Financial Group today. The shares plunging the most in more than two decades after the parent of Silicon Valley Bank announcing a stock offering and well, uh, getting rid of some things that are on its balance sheet. a lot of concern out there right now. It was an old fashioned bank run with a digital twist. Lines were forming around the block. Founders' iPhones lit up with texts urging them to go run for the exits, pouring fuel on the fire. On March 9th, depositors tried to pull $42 billion from Silicon Valley Bank, equivalent to $29 million a minute. By the end of the day, the bank had a negative cash balance of $958 million. The stock tumbled 61%. That wiped out $9.6 billion of market capitalization. Big thing to remember here, the US banking system relies on the confidence of its depositors. If that disappears and everyone runs to withdraw their money at the same time, it all falls apart. So ensuring that depositors can access their money is in the best interest of, well, really everyone. Government, VCs, employees on payroll, the list goes on. So on Friday, March 10th, regulators at the FDIC seized the business, making it the biggest US lender to fail since 2008. Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. By the following Monday, a fix, kind of, had been cobbled together. Apart from a deal with HSBC to buy the bank's UK arm for a nominal one pound, about $1.20, no buyer had yet been found, but the government pledged that depositors would be made whole, even those who had more than the $250,000 limit at the bank. Startups around the world breathed a sigh of relief. Yes, there were concerns that the ultimate owner of SVB wouldn't be quite as willing to work with riskier tech startups as its predecessor, but at least the startups had their money. And that was something to be grateful for.